right, thank you very much, Adam, for that introduction. Um, huge thanks to jQueryConf for having me here. Uh, this is actually my first conference talk, so I'm really excited. Uh, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, today's talk is going to be about recreating nostalgic computer games in the browser. But before I get into that, this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm Sarah Gorecki. I'm Ophelia's Daisies, uh, most places on the internet, GitHub and Twitter included. Uh, I live in New York City, and as Adam mentioned, I run the QueensJS meetup. I graduated from the Flatiron School, one of the New York City uh, boot camps in March, and Ashley Williams, who's over in the front row, was one of my amazing instructors there. And currently, I'm a node engineer at Penton Media, uh, working with John Paul, who gave the wonderful keynote this morning. Um, there's many, many things I can tell you about myself, but probably the one that's most relevant to this talk is that I love video and computer games. Um, they're pretty awesome, and they come in all kinds of flavors. Uh, there are really um, action-heavy platformer games. There are um, some really amazing indie games that have really low-key graphics, but wonderful gameplay. And then there are the nostalgic games that we all know and love, like Mario and Pac-Man. Um, so with my love of games, I wanted to make one for a while. Um, but I didn't want to have to really worry about coming up with game rules or coming up with a story or, or any of that. I wanted to just figure out how the game logic works and how to go about creating one from a programming standpoint. Um, and so I decided to dive into this. Um, while I was back in Flatiron, there was uh, a um, assignment that we had actually to, to basically just make a simple card game um, to get more comfortable with DOM manipulation and, and traversing the DOM. And so I took this a step further and I decided to recreate Spider Solitaire. Um, oh, jumped ahead. Um, so who here has played Spider Solitaire? Yeah, so that's most people here. Um, it got really, really popular with Windows XP, uh, but I found out it was actually packaged up with some Unix systems as far back as 1989. So it's been around for quite a while. Um, so when preparing for building the game, I started out by playing many, many, many rounds of Spider Solitaire. And the rules are actually a lot more complicated than I had initially remembered. Um, basic concept of the game is you want to remove all the cards from the table, and most of the rules had to do with clicking on the cards, moving the cards from one column to another, uh, and there were a lot of validation rules with how you can stack cards. So, you know, you can put a two on top of a three, but not on top of a card of any other value, for example. The suit doesn't matter when you're moving cards around initially, but if you um, stack cards that are off suit, you have to remove the the top cards before you can access the ones of the other suit. So that's the basic setup that we're working with. Um, Spider Solitaire is played with two decks of cards. You deal out 54 to start. Um, the difficulty level is based on the number of suits you're playing with. And each card basically has two important practical values, which are the numeric value and the suit, and then two aesthetic uh, properties, which are the face value and the color. Um, in planning the game, I didn't want to have to create cards each time, obviously. That would have been way too much work. Um, and Spider Solitaire has no complex timings or animations. Everything's fairly static, and you're just moving on click events. Um, so these properties of the game actually made it perfect candidate for building, uh, for building the game in the DOM and for storing all the game state there. Um, so before I even started programming, I went about by charting out the different states that the cards in the game would have at different points in time, and all of the events that would happen on various clicks. Um, so we have our active cards. Um, these are active and face up. These are all the ones that we can interact with, and they also are the ones that we can select. So in this example, if we clicked on the king of diamonds, the queen of diamonds would also become selected at the same time uh, because they're stacked, one stacked on top of the other. We also have our face down cards, which is the vast majority of the board when we first start out. Um, those can't be re interacted with. We also have our reserve cards uh, in the bottom corner. And these are not part of the board, um, but they can be dealt to the board, uh, one card to each column, if we run out of moves and want to switch things up. 
And we also have the blocked cards, and the blocked cards are the ones that have a different suit on top of them, so we need to uncover them before we can actually access them and move them around. So I basically gave each card a card class um, that made it really easy for me to target and manipulate them. And based on the state that each card had, I also would give it one of these other classes. Uh, and again, I, would, I was very meticulous about charting out and planning ahead of time which cards would have which class at which time. So for example, a card that's face down will lose the face, face down class once the card immediately on top of it was removed. Um, this game had a very thin backend, uh, and so it just read all the card data from a YAML file and served it straight up to the client, and everything else was handled in the DOM from that point on. Um, I basically created a poor man's two-dimensional array when I was building this, uh, and I made different column divs, and each div would have the appropriate numbering of cards. Um, I also dealt all the cards face down to start with because I didn't want to have to worry when first generating the board which cards would have which states. I wanted it all to just be the same. I also created card templates basically so that um, the, the data would be automatically loaded in from a YAML file. Um, and I recognize now that this was probably not the best decision at the time, but back when I built this, each card had four child divs inside it that had the face, value, color, and suit stored inside, just as values. Uh, again, not the best decision, but it worked at the time. And PS, it makes it really easy to cheat, cheat if you try playing my version of the game later. <laughs> <laughs> so now on to the JavaScript. Um, the very first thing we do on the, the document load is we flip over the last uh, card in each column, and now we can start playing. So. Let's go. Um, everything in the game basically happens on a click event. Um, and we don't really have to worry about that. Um, I realized during building th this game that's really, really easy when storing everything in the DOM to just come up with JavaScript spaghetti. Um, and so we're not going to get into like the line by line code. But generally, this is what's going on there. If you click on a card, on the board, and the card does not have a face down class, and it does not have a blocked class, and if there are no other selected cards, then congratulations, those cards can be selected. The else in this sta if else statement is where the entire rest of the game happens. <laughs> um, and so I kind of got to this point, and I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. This is way more complicated than I thought I was getting into. Let me take a step back. And so I broke things down into really small parts um, and just worked my way through one step at a time. Um, so I thought I was ready to play. Um, but as it turns out, I actually wasn't. Um, because the most basic thing, clicking the card event, I was targeting all of the cards on the board. But I completely forgot about these little reserve cards uh, down in the bottom. These are not part of the board. Um, and so when I deal them onto the board, they wouldn't respond to any events. Uh, and this is when I first learned the power of delegation. Um, and so by changing my logic around to apply the click events to the columns and then letting it bubble up to the card, then I solved my first uh, hurdle in this process. So what about that else in that huge if-else statement we saw before, um, the rest of the game logic? A lot of it just has to do with manipulating the DOM and moving the cards around between different columns. Um, so when cards are selected, you move the selected cards to a new column and append them there by clicking. You're removing and adding classes depending on what you're clicking on at a particular time. Um, and this brings us to a pretty good state in the game. We can click around, we can move all the cards, but it also lets you do literally whatever you want. We're not doing any validation yet, and so that was the next task. Um, so validating, we, uh, when I was doing this, I was literally just um, pulling the values out of the DOM, just finding the elements I wanted and just pulling everything out. Um, so as I said before, since all of the cards have children divs with the properties that matter, including the value in the class, I would just pick, find the selected card, pull out those properties, and compare them to the column that I was going to move, and then apply block and remove face down as needed. Um, 
Also, if you don't unblock your cards, it's a really good way to have your game end really quickly. Uh, and so in a case like this, if the five was moved off, uh, the six would automatically become unblocked, and then I would evaluate each card going up the column in turn. Um, but one note about unblocking cards, at first I was just comparing the suit, because I was like, oh, if you're moving the cards around, of course the numbers are always going to go in the right order. Except that is false. Um, because of, the again, those pesky reserve cards, they add a huge element of unpredictability. So you can't assume that the numbers are going to be what you expect. They can actually be any card at any time in the game. Um, finally, in order to check how to win the game, um, once a card is moved from one column to another, I would evaluate that column and see if there was a king in it. Because without a king, you can't win. Um, if a king was found, I would then work my way down the column, check each card to see if the suit and the value were appropriate for that set. If it was wrong, then great, I could just give up, try again later. But if it, was, uh, if it stayed correct and I got all the way down to finding an ace of the same suit, then that whole set of cards can just be removed and you're one step closer to winning. Um, so, um, it was a little tedious to be pulling all the information out of the DOM constantly. Ooh, where's my thing? Um, but I got a working spider solitaire. So we're going to check out the two suits of medium. Oh, and that looks really bad here. Uh, all right. So here we can select the jack, for example, put it on the queen. Now the queen can't move. Um, but we can put the seven on the eight. Now they can move together, and the cards are flipping face up as needed. And then we can deal more random cards and continue on. Yeah, so Spider Solitaire. Um, so yeah, building Spider Solitaire, it was great. It was a lot of fun. I, I felt like I could build anything after doing this because you know, there was a lot of comp more complicated logic that I didn't expect to have to sort out. Um, and I made a successful DOM-based game. It was great. But I knew that there was more. And I knew that there were more game building techniques that I would have to learn in order to build so something more complicated because storing everything in the DOM can only take you so far. I mean, I was thinking, what if I wanted to add in uh, animations? What if I was building a game that was depending on speed or just something that had any greater level of complexity, really? Um, and so I decided it was time for Tetris. So who here has played Tetris? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> So pretty much everyone, so I'm not going to go into the roles. I mean, pieces are added, pieces fall, rows are removed, pieces rotate. Um, it's one of those classic games that we all know and love. Um, but this brought in a lot of new challenges for actually building a game. There's constant animation, things are always moving, multiple things happen at once, pieces are falling down and can rotate and move left and right at the same time. Um, and so initially, my first inclination was to fall back on putting everything in the DOM, because that's what I did for Spider Solidaire, and for that it worked great. Um, but I knew pretty quickly that that wasn't going to work out in this case. So um, I decided to completely separate the game logic from the DOM and move down that route. First off, I didn't want to end up with a game that was like this, a wonderful comic from XKCD. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so I knew that I had to define what the pieces and the board were. And by the way, this is playable. Someone made it, and you can find it online. Um, so I, made, I decided to make piece and board objects. So the pieces have a shape chosen at random. Um, they know the different configurations they can have. They're aware of the board they belong to. They know where they are on the board. Uh, and they know whether or not they're active or if they you know, are stuck at the bottom. And the board is a grid. It has an active piece. It knows whether or not the game is active or if it's paused. Uh, and the board is what's controlling the speed of the game and the rendering. Um, so to render the board, I use tables. Just kidding. Uh, I, actually, I actually used handlebars templates. 
Um, and so in the, uh, so I set the width and the height, and I basically um, just used handlebars to iterate through this grid and create column divs and tile divs inside. Um, I would check each tile for any content, um, and if it had anything there, it would get the class active, and so then the tile would appear on the board instead of being an empty grid. Um, something else that I also learned in rendering the board um, is that iterating over an undefined, an array filled with undefined values is not really a good idea. Um, initially, at the first pass through, the board was just all undefined. I was like, that's great. Everything just doesn't matter what they are. Uh, and then later, I changed them to false just because it worked better. Um, and you could iterate. So now that we have the board, uh, we could move on to the pieces. Uh, this is also a playable XKCD comic that you can find. Um, there are seven different piece types in Tetris. Um, and so for each piece, I basically created, or for all the pieces, I created an object of arrays with each object containing the properties for that type of piece, including the different orientations. Um, and so I had that starting point. Um, in order to build, um, mesh the game and uh, the board and the pieces together, I created the game loop. There are actually two game uh, event loops happening in my Tetris game. There's the rendering and there's the game logic. And while at times the two match up, I'm keeping them completely independent and that just gives a lot more freedom over what you can do when building a game. Um, I'm using a set interval that's set at 50 milliseconds. So every 50 milliseconds, I'm ticking the board and ticking the piece, but things don't have to actually change on every tick. It's just checking to see if anything will. Um, and again, this gives us a lot of freedom because uh, moving a piece down at the regular intervals doesn't happen very often, but you can rotate a piece and move them back and forth really, really quickly. Uh, so it's important to keep these elements separate. Um, there are also two different ticks, the board tick and the piece tick. The board tick handles adding new pieces to the board when there are no active pieces, telling the active piece that it's time for the active piece to tick as well, removing complete rows and rendering the board. And then the piece tick is responsible for taking user input and moving the piece appropriately, um, rotating the piece and adding it to the board and removing it from the board at specified locations. So now we can start actually getting our game. We have the basic components, now let's start to build it. Uh, time to start building it. Um, so first we need to, of course, add our starting piece to the board. If the board has no piece, it's gonna generate a new one and pass itself into the piece. Um, the piece, remember, it knows where it is on the board. It knows the coordinates of its upper left-hand corner. Um, and so the way that we add a piece to the board is we can check the piece template against those coordinates on the board. And when uh, one of those tiles on the piece exists, we can change the corresponding value on the board to true. Um, and then our piece is added. If we're adding a piece, we also need to be able to remove it. But this is a lot easier because the only true values on the board are the ones of that current active piece. And so we can just iterate over the entire board and whenever we find true, turn that value to false. And once we have this adding and removing, it's actually really easy to move the piece down at the regular intervals. Um, basically in this game, I'm just checking to see if 500 milliseconds or more has passed. Uh, and if that's the case, then I just move that coordinate tile down by one. And then I'll remove the piece from the board add it in the new location, and then re-render. Um, so what does that leave us with? We're basically having something that looks a little bit like this. We have a piece that's added to the board, and it keeps on moving down, and then it just keeps on going. You know, uh, it's, it's a great start, but this is not Tetris. Um, so the next step is to stack the pieces, right? We need to first check and make sure that the piece isn't gonna go off the bottom of the board because, again, we need to actually keep them here. Um, but when we're just checking for the bottom of the board, the pieces just overwrite each other. So that's not what we want either, obviously. 
Um, so in addition to checking for the bottom of the board, we also need to see if the piece is going to overlap another piece the next time that it moves down. Um, so once we solve that, our pieces can build up and then we can lose Tetris. Yeah. It's great progress. <laughs> um, the way, by the way, that I'm freezing the pieces I'm, is I'm literally just changing the value of the piece from true to frozen. And so it's just checking to see if it would overlap with the tile that's frozen the next time it moves. Um, so now we don't want to have to lose Tetris every single time we play. We want to have at least a little bit of a chance. Um, so next step is to get the keyboard input in there. Um, finally, we're back to using jQuery, right? We're, we're looking for key down events, and we want the pieces to, court, to move appropriately. Um, but again, I'm trying to keep all my game logic out of the DOM this time, and I want to try to separate it and keep the game logic in the, the board and the piece uh, objects. And so instead of just having the event fire, when I press a key on the keyboard, I created this board input object. Um, and so this way, I'm able to, instead of responding immediately to events, I'm able to store the state of what is currently happening on the keyboard. Um, and this ended up being a lot more efficient. It's actually similar to how a lot of gamepad APIs work. Um, and so basically, on, on a key down, I'm, I'll change the corresponding value here to true. And then on key up, I change it back to false. And then the entire time that the value is true, just the appropriate function will fire off on every tick. So since we already went through adding pieces to the board um, and moving them down, moving right and left is pretty similar. Again, we're going to just have to check um, one, one uh, column to the right or to the left to make sure that we're not going to run into the board edge and make sure that we're not going to go off the board edge. Uh, this is a situation where it's really bad to have an off by one error. It leads to some very interesting board games. Um, but once we're done with uh, fixing our bugs there, then we can move our pieces back and forth. We can drop them. Um, the only things left really are adding in rotation and being able to remove the complete column, uh, complete rows. Um, rotations, again, we're getting input similar to how we did for moving right and left and down faster. Um, each piece has an array, again, of all of the orientations. Uh, when we rotate a piece, the coordinates don't have to change at all. The upper left-hand corner is staying in the same spot. And so in that array of possible orientations, we're just moving through the array. And we, when we get back to the end, we can just go back to index zero. Um, Another thing with the rotation that I came across is when you're spinning a piece, uh, spinning a piece at 50 mil uh, once every 50 milliseconds is way too fast, and it makes it almost impossible to land on the rotation that you think you're going to. And so similar to how I slowed down the, the default moving down speed, uh, I did the same for the rotation, and I isolated that and separated it from the tick speed. But of course, we need to also check to see if we can rotate. Uh, and we need to validate our rotations. We don't want to rotate off the, the grid, and we don't want to rotate into other pieces. Um, Tetris has this handy thing called a wall jump that most versions implement. Uh, and so if it's going to rotate off the grid, it just pushes itself back in, like that piece did right there. Um, and so I decided I would implement this as well. And so basically, if it was going to go off the grid, I would just move the coordinates over by one to make sure that it stayed in. Uh, I did not apply that in terms of overlapping other pieces. So if the tile, uh, if one of the tiles in the piece was going to overlap a frozen piece, I just wouldn't let it rotate. Um, finally, we can get on to actually winning the game. Um, we're, when we are evaluating this, it's pretty simple. We, I'm delegating this back to the board. Uh, you just have to iterate over all of the columns iterate over all the rows in each column. And if you have a row that's made completely out of frozen tiles, then congratulations. Um, you are one step closer to not losing. So you can um, splice that row off, unshift a new row to the top of the grid. Uh, and that's perfect, because you don't have to worry about closing the gap. Um, if you were to just turn a row to false values, then you'd have an empty row. But just removing the row completely solves that. 
and then you have to add it back to the top otherwise, you know, obviously your grid would just keep on shrinking. And that would be problematic. Um, so let's play. So here is Tetris. We can rotate pieces, we can drop them. Oh, I can't actually see how my grid is lining up from this angle. Uh, that's problematic. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And, oh, so close. Let's see if I can see enough. Yeah! Thank you. Yeah, so that's Tetris. Thank you. Um, so there are extra features that I want to add to my Tetris game. I want to make the pieces different colors. Uh, I want to add losing right now. It just goes to the top and nothing happens. Uh, I want to actually make the score uh, keep track of how well you're doing instead of just staying zero uh, and add a little piece preview so that you see what's coming next. Um, and these are all things that are really manageable by keeping all the game state in the DOM. For Spider Solitaire, I quickly realized that whenever I was trying to add new features, just having all this data in the DOM and nowhere else made it really complicated to add anything new to it. But for Tetris, keeping all that isolated makes it really easy to add improvements and add features. Um, so I, in going through all this process, I realized that games are a lot of fun to play and even more fun to build at times. Um, so I keep on talking to people and other friends and programmers who keep on saying, oh yeah, I've always wanted to build a game. It's a lot of fun. So I would say just go and do it. Um, games are awesome. A lot of times they're not very technically complicated and it's all in how you're thinking about them and planning them out. It's just all in figuring out the game logic. So I highly encourage all of you to Go and build your favorite games too. Thank you.